Well, hello. How are you? As you see, I'm not Jim. You know, it's, uh, you know, Jim can take a, a little bit of scripture and make you so fascinated by what you're reading. Well, just so you know, I'm not Jim. So, go ahead. So you get Dwayne. Hey, can you hear me now? Nope. Cool. Wait, I'm there. All right. Okay. The book of Isaiah, that's where we're still at. And um, One of the things I get a lot of comments from is the God of the Old Testament seems mean, and the God of the New T uh, Testament seems lovey. Can I tell you he's the same God? He's Jesus. He hasn't changed. He's the same. The law had a purpose, and the law was perfect in every way. The problem is we're not a perfect people. So we couldn't live up to God's standard. So being the merciful God he is, he gave us a way out of our sins. And when I read this, and I'm looking in uh, 33, and it says distress and help, 32, the kingdom of righteousness, we get into 34, and it's judgment against the world. And a lot of times people say, well, how can he be a loving God if he's going to punish the world? And I said, if he's a just God, then punishment needs to happen. If he's a loving God, if you, you have a child and you're a loving parent, you punish your children when they need to be punished. It's how it works. God is a loving God. He's a caring God. But there's ultimate judgment. And people don't understand that um, all of us are called to be stewards. You're stewards of your marriage, so how are you doing there? You're stewards of everything God has given you. This planet is his. You breathe his air. You walk on his earth. You drink his water. And so when I was pondering all this judgment on the nations, I thought, what lousy stewards have we been with God? His planet, we polluted it in every way, shape, or form. We polluted it through things going over the Internet. Uh, there's rape and violence and murders and everything going on through the world, and people want to just ex escape judgment. The problem is God said he put a measure of faith in all men. I remember being a little kid years ago, probably fifth, sixth grade, um, and for some odd reason, I just wanted to go to church. I really can't tell you if I ever went to church before that other than to be in a choir, I think, in Germany. But there was just a Sunday I just wanted to be in church. My parents didn't practice anything at that time. And so I decided I was going to take a walk two and a half miles so I could go to church. It was a Baptist church way up on the hill. And when I told my friends, all my friends wanted to go, and there was like four of us. I probably didn't enter a church again, let's say, for, uh, other than a wedding or a funeral, probably for another 20 years or hmm, probably not that long, 15 years. Um, but I always knew there was a God because God put a measure of faith in everybody. So when t people tell me they're atheists, I said, no, you just don't want to be held accountable. See, if I say there is no God, then my actions are fine. But if we turn to the point that we understand there is a God, then we've got to understand there's judgment. Now, if you're a child of the king, you got to scapegoat in Christ Jesus. He took your sins. But the problem I see with a lot of people today is what Jesus said to the Pharisees in the 15th chapter of Matthew. And he quoted a verse out of Isaiah. It says, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teaching are of mere men. And the problem with the church is if we're the bride, that cannot be us. God's called you to a higher standard. He's called you to a higher standard in your marriage, in your stewardship of this planet. Everything we do should glorify God. I fell. I'm not perfect. I'd like to tell you guys I'm perfect, but I'd be lying. Okay, we all fell, and that's why we need a Savior.
That's the whole purpose Christ came. He didn't want to live without you. One of the things I tell huh, people that aren't saved besides uh, Jesus loves them is after I talk with them a while, I said, you know the amazing thing is? God loves you just where you are. But too much to leave you that way. And he decided the world wasn't complete until you were in it or you wouldn't be here. God has a plan and purpose for every one of us. Whether we work on that plan or not is our choice. But for a Christian, this should be our daily food. You know how many times I hear people quote stuff that they think in the Bible or misquote things that are in the Bible? And I'm looking, I'm like, sorry, that's not biblical. And, uh, and it's not to judge them or anything, but too many times we hear a preacher preach or somebody, and it sounds good, and we say, hey, that's for me. Dig in your word. Because I can tell you, when I first started reading this word, when I went through the whole Bible my first time, I thought I didn't learn anything. Second time, I didn't think I learned very much either. Third time, I was starting to understand a little more. The fourth time, I got a little better. About the seventh time, I started f figuring things out. But then I could understand when false teaching would hit my ears. But in this chapter, it's judgment against the nations. And, you know, there's a teaching came out years ago, and it actually it's got pretty big there for a while. I haven't heard much about it. But it's called All Inclusion. And if I remember right, the guy came out of one of the big uh, TV evangelist uh, churches, but he says at the end everybody would be saved, including Satan. Uh -oh. And I, if that's not a false teaching, I haven't heard one before that bad. Um, it entered into uh, a lady started accepting that into my brother-in-law's church, and he finally had a talk with her and said, well, if that's what you truly believe, this probably isn't the place for you because there is judgment. But uh, she didn't want to hear about judgment. Uh, but judgment is something that is coming upon this earth. And part of it is tainted with sin. That wasn't God's perfect plan. Uh, people say, how do you think heaven's going to be? I said, a lot like the Garden of Eden. Because I believe that was God's perfect plan. He had a job for Adam. And it was to take care of the garden. He had a plan. He was a steward of it. God give him a helpmate, uh, not one he could rule over, but the one to help him out. If you ever notice, there's a lot more different than men and women um, than just uh, the physical parts. You know, I, uh, women seem to pick up the emotional parts a lot better than men do. I remember I, uh, my ex-wife, she told me one day, can't you see your son's hurting? No, I don't have a clue he's hurting. But she could feel it. And so I tell people, God took more than a rib. And if you walk together in unity, God can do amazing things through you. And if you're single, that's okay too. All right, so we're going to talk about judgment. It's chapter 34, and it starts this. Come near, you nations, and listen. Pay attention, you peoples. Let the earth hear and all that is in it, the world and all, of, all that comes out of it. Yahweh is angry with all nations. His wrath is on all their armies. He will totally destroy them. He will give them over to slaughter. Their slain will be thrown out. Their dead bodies will stink. The mountains will be soaked with their blood. All the stars in the sky will dissolve, and the heavens rolled up like a scroll. All the starry hosts will fall like withered leaves from the vine like sh shriveled figs from a tree. Judgment. As we read uh, on in this judgment, we'll see a lot that pertains to revelations in the final hour. But that's not God's heart. God's heart is nobody to be lost. But if we're giving God's lip service and we're not doing what God's called us to do, we're no better than the Pharisees. I know some people read this book and they become self-righteous and they are no better than the Pharisee. Their witness is lousy. They don't witness the people. Most people don't like them. And we can't be one that just honors God with our lips. God's called us to love one another. And you know what? 
God that has a heart for the lost. So I think it's the church's job also to have a heart for the lost. For God to love the world. He didn't say the saved. He didn't say the redeemed. He didn't say the church. He didn't say the Jewish nation. He said the world. There's not a man out there that hasn't been made in the image of God. And God loves that person. But ultimately, it comes down to will you surrender to God? And the world won't. You hear of wars and rumor of wars, and I uh, see what's going on in the news, and it seems like as long as man's been on this planet, all we did is destroy it and one another. It's bad enough that the world will tear down one another, but the church should not tear down one another. We shouldn't tear down our marriages. What I challenge people, speak life into your marriage. How do you speak life? Look at your wife say, honey, you're beautiful. Everybody gets negative all the time. But unfortunately, sin has entered this planet and the universe. And God said he'll deal with all of that at the end. But until then, you're here for a plan and a purpose. And that plan is purpose is to be a witness to those around you. To your grandkids, to your kids, to your wife, to your cousin, to your sisters, to your brothers. That's why we're here. God, if it, you know, I had people, friends that uh, I worked together with, and one called me up one day, and he was really upset, and he goes, I want to work with you again because I don't work with any saved people. And I said, God is done with me and you being together. Now you need to be a light over there, and I'll be a light over here. And he goes, well, I really don't like you. And I said, welcome to the world. <laughs> I don't like it either. So my nephew, one day, he, he seen me, and I deal with, I'm a general foreman, so the, when I get on the job, it's mine to run the job. So I deal with a lot of people from all trades, and some born again, and some not. And he goes, Uncle, I don't know how you do it. And I go, do what? He goes, how you re keep your integrity and everything working with all these guys. I said, you understand that I work with these guys, I witness to these guys, but I don't run with these guys. There's a fine line you've got to learn. I don't hang out with these guys after work. I'll share Jesus if they need prayer. They got my number. They can contact me. But I don't run with them. I am called to be a light, and I don't want my life snuffed out. So um, understand that when you read the judgment of God, it does not pertain to the church. It's not for us. If you... Love Jesus. The key is a relationship with God. Not li lip service, not saying, you know, I said the prayer back in kindergarten and now I'm trying to see how much sin I can get away with. You missed the boat. Understand that a simple prayer isn't what God's after. He's after your heart. And if he has it at your heart, he has all of you. The problem is in the churches of the day, it's, it seems really sad that we can't even agree on the simple things. I've had people tell me, well, if the church isn't in its own building, it is not a church. I was like, heck, how did the early church do it? They're in houses. They didn't have a building. Paul did it down by the river sometimes. We're not here to judge people. But we can't condone sin either I have a lot of people when they're young in the Lord or older in the Lord will sit down and have conversations and one of the things I get tired of hearing was don't you think God to give everybody another chance I said he gave you his son the blood of his son how much more do you want from him because I'll be honest with you if that was my son the world would already be destroyed I'm just being honest so when you read the scripture and you see where God is a God of judgment, to be a just God, there has to be judgment. It's his last deed he wants to do. That's why it's at the end of the book. There's always punishment for governments when they do stuff. It's just when does that reach its full sin. In 33, it said, the Lord is exalted for the 
for he dwells on high. He will fill Zion with his justice and righteousness. He will be the sure foundation for your times, a rich store of salvation and wisdom and knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the key to treasures. So in the 33rd chapter of this book, God said, hey, pay attention. I'm your true treasure. Everything you need in life is given to you by God. It's simple. We don't even thank him for the air we breathe, but it is his air. Everything is his. So I want to take a look at Romans 3, 21. It says, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all, all who believe. There is no difference between Jews and Gentiles, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by this grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of blood, to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, he had left the sin committed beforehand unpunished. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time. So all, so as to be just and the one who is justified who have faith in Jesus to believe in Jesus, uh, we look up that word and we say, well, I believe in Jesus. Well, so do the demons. How many are saved? That word believe is, means to put one spiritual trust and to commit. It's a commitment to God. The same way people were saved in the Old Testament, same way they were saved in the New Testament. They had a relationship with God. That's why it says work out your salvation with fear and trembling. There's work to be done. So what I tell people, that's why paradise was needed for a short time until Christ was glorified. But the saints of old couldn't go to the rightful place until Christ was crucified. Yeah, you, that's a different Bible study, but if you have questions about it, you can talk to me. You can look it up. It's called Paradise or Abraham's Bosom. Some people think it's just an imaginary story, but if you pay attention to it, Jesus was speaking. It's not a story. It was a real place. So we'll go on to verse 5. My sword has drunk its fill in the heavens. See, it descends in judgment on Edom, the people I have totally destroyed. The sword of the Lord is bathed in blood. It is covered with fat, the blood of lambs and goats, fat from the kidney of the rams. For Yahweh has a sacrifice in Boza and a great slaughter in the land of Eden. And the wild oxen will fall with them the bulls, the calves, and the great bulls. Their land will be drenched with blood, and the dust will be soaked with fat. Eden, the Edomites. You know what's really sad about these group of people? They're cousins, cousins with the Jewish nation. Problem is they had jealousy. Jealousy should never be part of a Christian's walk, ever. But they were so jealous they hated the Jewish nation. They did everything they could to go against the Jewish nation. It's horrible if you ever studied the Edomites, what they do, did to the Jewish nation. And every time the Jewish nation was getting punished by an arm, army, they were rejoicing. God said, I had enough. Let me tell you something. Uh, Israel is the apple of God's eyes, period. Jerusalem is where the new city will be taken. You are the apple of God's eyes. So if you're going to look at the whole picture, the world is against two things that you'll find very strong. Do you notice everybody hates the Jews and we, they can't give you a reason why? And lately you can see that pretty much most of the nations hate Christianity. You ever notice that? I'm shocked sometimes when I watch television what they say about Christianity or the Jewish nation. Uh, <clears throat> you've seen Hamas, and what I don't understand, it's being a good reporter, you think you would report the whole story. Not part of the story. 
Do you know what Hamas means? Violence. That's what that word means. Hamas is violence. <clears throat> so, all these people who are chanting, you know, they have a right. And I thought about it, and I thought, well, if you asked me, I'd say, wouldn't you like to remove the violence of the land? And I know they say yes, and I'd say, well, Hamas means violence. Violence against who? They hate Christianity, and they hate the Jewish nation. And because of that, judgment will come on this planet. <clears throat> now, like I said, for Christian, it's not judgment um, if you have a relationship with God. So we're going to take a look at the final judgment in Re Revelation 19 <clears throat> and 11. It says, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, who the rider is called Faithful and True, with justice he judges and wages war. How much justice do you see on TV anymore? There is none. I was so amazed about 10 years ago, maybe 15 years ago, how every time somebody killed somebody or killed four or five, they said, poor guy, look what his parents did. And I was like, you're feeling sorry for the guy that committed the crime and not the victims? And if you look at the world... A lot of people now are turning to Israel. The United Nations just voted and America vetoed it that they're going to go against Israel for being attacked by violence. God's a God of justice. Sometimes I hear a, a rapist gets two years in prison. I'm like God said, execute them. If you executed quite a few of them, you wouldn't have it no more. To be honest, that's the problem. God is a God of justice. And when you see these drug cartels and everything going on in the world, there will be judgment because these people neither fear God or care. So when you read about God's judgment, what I want you to realize also is he's a righteous God. And what he does is right. Have any of you ever been rebuked by the Lord? Just curiosity. I have. When God told me I was wrong. And God deals with me on that. God is a loving God. He loves you more than anything. Uh, you know, everybody else is God you got to die for. Mine hung on the cross. Forgive me. So when you read about the judgment of God, remember, if you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might, and you love your neighbor as yourself, Judgment doesn't come for you. Does it mean there won't be hard times? No. There is hard times. There's a lot of Christians still today being beheaded. Hamas doesn't care if you're a Christian or a Jew or if you're just from America. They're, they mean violence. That's what they mean. Some of the horrific, horrific stuff that came out January 7th was shocking. It was totally shocking. And yet I see people in America protesting Israel and said they had a right to. Every man is made in the image of God. You don't have a right to just kill people because you don't like their nationality or race. If you're a Christian, you should see no race. A Christian should be the furthest one to see race. You know, I've met Muslims that were born in me. Interesting story. Uh, there was a Muslim working for Compassion International years ago, and I go, "How do you?" Uh, a friend of mine asked him how he became saved. He was raised Muslim. He goes, "Oh, I read that Bible just to tear you Christians apart. I knew it better than ninety percent of Christians I ran into." So he went at this guy, Compassion International, goes, "I want to debate the Bible with you." Guy goes, "All right, let's have a seat." And he said he sat across from me, and he goes, "I just ripped into him every way I could." For 15 minutes, I went on and on and on and on about uh, lip service to God, not being faithful to God. And uh, when he was done, he said he looked over at the table at the other guy, and he goes, do you know how much Jesus loves you, <laughs> that he died for you, that you're made in his image, and he thinks the world over? 
He said about 10 minutes of him speaking, he was in tears and received Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. <laughs> We're not called to debate anybody. We're called to be a witness. But in this world, there's going to be trials, tribulations, and there's going to be all kinds of horrible things. But we've got to understand that God's a righteous God, and he's the final judge. So when you read it, uh, Galen asked me once, when you read that, what do you think? God is love. She goes, what? I go, when I read uh, when God punishes nation, God is love. He's a just God. He's a caring God. He doesn't like bullies. If we just could follow the moral compass of the Ten Commandments, we could wipe out every sin on the planet. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you could keep those two, you wouldn't want to do the rest of them. Jesus said, who's your neighbor? He said, everybody. Who would you want to harm? Who would you want to kill? Who would you want to steal to or lie to or cheat? Love your neighbor as yourself. All right, let us go on. It says, his eyes are like blazing fire, and on his heads are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dripped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, that's Christ. His robes are dripped in blood. What's the blood all about? All those martyred for the name of Jesus. All those killed for no reason. All the innocent. <clears throat> and it says, the armies of heavens were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of God of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun who cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair, Come, gather together with the great supper of God so that you may eat the flesh of the kings, generals, and mighty, of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all the people, free and slave, great and small. <clears throat> Out of the mouth of the rider of the horse and all the birds gorge themselves on the flesh. Then I saw the beast and the king of the earth, and there came armies gathered together to wage war against the rider of the horse and his army. But the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet who had performed the signs on its behalf. With these signs he had deluded those who have received the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. The rest were killed with the sword, come out of the mouth of the rider of the horse, and all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. This battle is going to take about what they call uh, the battle of decision. Some call it the battle, uh, the valley of Jehoshaphat. It's basically the same place. The valley of decision is where God will sit and judge everywhere. So they believe this is going to be the Kenan Valley. Um, we're not sure. God doesn't give us a point. But when he comes back to the earth, there will be judgment. All the armies will lay low, and everybody will have to give account for what he or she did. Whether you believe in Hamas or Jesus or whoever. Now there's two ways I tell people God's going to see you. He will see you under grace, under the blood of Jesus Christ, or you will be judged according to the law. It's all that God has. The law, he'll either look at you and say, well done, good or faithful servant, or get away from me, I never knew you. If he says, get away from me, then we're judged according to the law. But this will come, this battle here. If we look at all the prophecies in the Bible, you've got to understand it's easy to look around now and see that things are shaking real badly together right now. It's interesting to me how Iran, China, and Russia 
have started to trust each other, even though it might only be a little bit. But for years, people said that would never happen. Russia doesn't tr trust China. China doesn't trust Russia, and nobody can trust Iran. So when you look at the bigger picture of everything, God is going to judge the nations for what they do. So as Gaylene and I talked, she goes, well, what about those that haven't heard? I go, honey, I'm going to tell you something. I believe there's not a soul on this planet that God doesn't try to reach. I read stories where Jesus appeared to people in visions and dreams. Probably one of the fascinating ones was this lady in India. And she goes, God, if you're there, I want you. And God started to speak to her. She goes, the problem is she's in Indonesia. They got many gods, but they don't have the God. And so she said, now God's speaking to me. I'm trying to get a Bible. She goes, try to get one in a poor country, in a big city. There's not a Bible. And so it took her a while, and she got a Bible. And she started to read that Bible. And in that Bible, God started speaking to her. And she got to, uh, to the part about being baptized. She goes, how am I going to do this? She makes the tub of water. She closed her nose. She said, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And she baptized herself. I believe there's not a soul out there that God does not try to reach. Not a one. So my question is, is there any that we don't want to reach? Enemies, family members we don't like? <laughs> I've been there. I've been there. I had a lady God sent me, and I didn't want nothing to do with her. And I prayed one day, God, get rid of her. And he said, I didn't send her there for you to judge her. I sent you there to love her. And I was like, ooh, I said, God, I don't like this chick. How am I going to love her? I said, I, I need your help. So I was preaching Jesus, and she wasn't. So I felt like everything I was doing to witness to all these people, she was undermining. And God said, well, I still called you to love her. And I said, well, you're going to have to give me your love for her because I don't like her. And he did. She got saved. And it wasn't because of me. I feel many days that I failed that test when God sent that lady to me. So judgment is harsh. And me and my wife talk about it, and we pray for people that don't like us. I pray for a revival in the Muslim countries. I pray that no one be lost. But as long as we're on this planet, we are to be a light to the world. God takes that very seriously. You need to be a light in your marriage. I don't know why if people are seeking God with all their heart, soul, and mind, we have so much marriage problem in the church. You know why we do? Because they read it, but they don't want to hear it. Love your wife. Well, I will when she submits to me. Submit to your husband. Why will if he, when he loves me? You see the problem? I tell people when I'm in prayer for my wife, God ain't dealing with my wife. He's dealing with Dwayne. He doesn't deal with my wife ever when I'm praying. He's dealing with me. What can I do better? Where do I need to be a better witness? How can I respond better to people? How I can be a better example. My wife says, some days you sit there and ponder. And I said, yeah, I'm trying to figure out where I could be better. A better witness. A better example. A better husband. A better dad. All the above. There's always room for improvement. As a Christian, if you're still on this planet, you still have time to love your wife and submit to your husband. Don't come to me and say you have marriage problems because the first thing I'm going to ask you is, are you doing your part? First thing I'm going to ask. Years ago, I read an article from Dr. Dobson. I either read it or no, I actually heard it on the radio. Dr. Dobson focused on the family, and he said this wife came up and said, I had it up to here to my husband. I'm leaving him. And he goes, why? She goes, hey, he's, he's a slime ball. I don't like him. don't want nothing to do with him. And he said he knew the marriage was pretty well over. But he goes, well, would you do me a favor since it's over? Would you do me a favor for one month? Can you suffer out one month? 
And she goes, I really don't want to, but yeah, if you want me to, I think I can give another month. He goes, I want you to submit to your husband in every way unless it's sin. Do you understand me? Well, I don't know if I can do that. He goes, well, here's the deal. For one month, you submit to your husband. You come in. After that month, you can tell me what you want to do. So she agreed. A month later, she came back and said, I have the best marriage there is. <laughs> she said, it's wonderful. Problem is, we don't want to do our part. We're waiting on God to somehow change his rules. And we think God's gonna, we can change God's mind. And it doesn't work that way. Anyways, let's get back to it. I'll finish off number 10 and 34. It says, for generation to generation, it will lie de desolate. No one would ever pass through it again. That's judgment on Edom for their wickedness to the Jewish people. You think anybody else is wicked to the Jewish people today? Mm. Apple of God's eyes. The desert owl, the screeching owl will possess it. The great owl, the raven, will nest there. God will stretch out over Edom. The measuring line is chaos. And the plumb line is desolation. Her nobles will have nothing there to be called a kingdom. All her princes will vanish away. Thorns will overrun the, her citadels. Nettles and brambles, her strongholds. She will become a haunt for jackals, a home for owls. Desert creatures will meet with hyenas and will, wild goats and bleat to each other. There the night creature will also lie down and find for themselves a place to rest. The owl will nest there and lay eggs. She will hatch them and care for her young under the shadow of the wings. There also the falcons will gather each with their mate. What does that tell you? There's no human activity. It is done. Judgment has been cast out. All because a nation hated another nation. That were their cousins. And heck, we can't talk to sisters and brothers without getting along. Ironically, I get along with all of mine. We don't always agree. But I do get along with all my siblings. Look in the scroll of the Lord and read. None of these things will be missing. Not one will lack her mate. For it is the mouth that has given her the order. And the spirit will gather them together. He allots their portions his hand distributes them by measure. They will possess it forever and dwell there for generations to generations. Judgment will be upon the whole earth. But the new, uh, good news is God has got another plan. Because the earth has been tainted with sin, violence, corruption. Um, to me, you know, I've had people say that, why did you vote for Donald Trump? I said I was tired of voting for lying politicians. I'm not saying he's a perfect man because uh, there's a lot of times I said, boy, I wish you'd just shut up. <laughs> if you just shut up, you'd be all right. You know? So uh, we're not looking for perfect people, but we are to be an example. Sometimes you need to apologize even if you don't think you were wrong. What would happen more people said, you know what, I'm sorry. Forgive me. What happened we did that more in our marriage? You know, the Bible says, let not the sun go down on your wrath. So I told my wife, we'll never go to bed without saying I love you and we kiss goodnight. We'll not go down with wrath. There's nothing that we can't talk about. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. <coughs> oh, boy, a new heaven and a new earth. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth has passed away, and there was no longer any sea. This is actually out of uh, 21st chapter of Revelations. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem. Guess where the new Jerusalem is going to be? On earth. But it's going to be new. It won't be tainted with uh, sin. Coming down of the heavens from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dress for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. Isn't that a beautiful sight? Think about that. God wants to hang out with me and you. 
I think more me, but that's okay. So, but isn't that neat that God wants to dwell with his people? They will be his people and God himself will be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Why? Everything's tainted in sin. Everything needs to be made new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give him water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit it all, this. And I will be their God, and they will be my children. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderer, the sexual immoral, those who practice magical arts and the idolaters and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is a second death. There is judgment for sin or salvation in Christ. There's your options. Um, I had a guy recently said, uh, what kind of life you live? I go nice, peaceful life at home. I'm also a pastor. He said, it sounds boring to me. I like to party and get drunk. He goes, have a real good time. I said, well, tell me how good time it is the next time you're in front of that judge. I said, I like my nice, peaceful life. But I don't sow seeds to disturb it. Does that make sense? I don't drink and drive. I don't do pot. You know, I'm kind of a homebody. Uh, But I have a nice, peaceful life. I like my life. (coughs) Anyways, in Psalm uh, 11, it says, the Lord is, uh, in the Lord I take refuge. How then can you say to me, flee like a bird to your mountain? For look, the wicked bends their bows and set their a- arrows against the strings to shoot from the shadows at the upright in heart. When the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. Yahweh is in his heavenly throne. He observes everyone on earth. His eyes examine them. Yahweh examines the righteous, but the wicked, those who love violence, he hates with passion. On the wicked, he will rain fiery coals and burning sulfur. A scorching wind will be their lot. For the Lord is righteous. He loves justice. The upright will see his face. So when we get in the scripture and we see where God's punishing people, that wasn't an ultimate plan. The ultimate plan was Garden of Eden. Did he know Adam was going to sin? Yes. And he made a way out of that sin, just as he made a way out for me and you. So when you read the Old Testament and you get to these part where you're saying, wow, God, you destroyed this nation and that nation and this nation, And you see the Valley of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat is an interesting name. And it says Yahweh will judge. It's called the Valley of Jehoshaphat or the Valley of Decision. We all have a decision to make. And my goal for each and every one of you is that in your marriages you love your spouse. You treat them worthy as you treat the Lord. And I promise you, you'll have a blessed marriage. It's not hard, folks. It really isn't. If you truly love your wife like you love the Lord, you'll have a blessed marriage. If you love your neighbor as yourself, you'd probably win him over even if he doesn't like you. You ever had those neighbors you just shake your head because you couldn't get along with? I've been there. Ironically, this time I have a couple neighbors that are born again and couple I'm working on to be born again. <laughs> That's how it works. I look at every opportunity. So when you read this Bible, and you come to a part where you say, man, that seems harsh, judgment, suffering. I want you to say to yourself, God is love, and he loves me. And he says he does not delight in the punishment of the wicked. 
but all of them would come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Amen? All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, Father God. <coughs> we know you're a just God, a loving God, Father. You loved us, Father, even when we were deep in sin. Father, I just pray that your hand would be upon all of us, Father, that we would be a better light, Father, that you show us your love, Father, for our fellow man, Father, for our sisters and brothers, Father God, our cousins, our mom and dad, Father. There's so much division, Father, and you say it shouldn't be in the church. So, Father, I just pray that there'll be healing in us so we can be the light to those around us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Change.